Good morning, everyone. This is Becky Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of the Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation, and we are thrilled to have you on our webinar today. Um, as many of you are aware, Healthy Weight uh, did a public health industry commitment uh, through the calorie commitment with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation serving as our independent outside evaluator. I know you're going to hear more about that along with some other commitments that have gone on throughout the industry today. And uh, Hank, Michael Newharse, Derek Yak will all share some of the best practices and things we've learned along the way. Um, but with that, I would like to turn the phone over to Hank Cardello from the Hudson Institute. Thank you, Becky. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to be here for our fifth session on the Bridging the Divide seminar series uh, supported by Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation and with additional support from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Today we're going to focus on best practices and uh, bring a lot of the topics we've been discussing across all these sections and pull them together and start talking about how we make things work. So what I want to do just to give you a quick overview of today is talk about um, initially the collaboration and commitment landscape between industry and the public health and NGO community. And then Derek Yak, uh, Chief Health Officer of the Vitality Institute, will provide some best practices examples uh, on both the public health and industry commitments. And then Michael Newworth, Senior Director of Public Relations at the Dannon Company, will join us and, and give a case history of what Dannon has done. Dannon is one of the early innovators in this space. And then finally, I'll come back and, and talk about how we might be structuring successful commitments how we track these things so that some serious uh, progress can be made. And then, uh, time permitting, we should have at least uh, 10 minutes at the end of our session uh, to answer any of the questions you might type in for us. We're more than happy to address those. So again, our objective for this entire seminar series is very straightforward, to enable more effective engagement, collaboration between industry and the public health community so that when the day is done, we can have more effective, better public health policies and policy outcomes and that we really move forward to achieve some of the stated objectives that are out there, for instance, such as reversing childhood obesity. So one thing we, uh, we have discussed is in moving towards solutions, we have to appreciate the mindsets are very different uh, across the groups. Uh, when you look at from an industry perspective, industry is focused on growth. And the metrics or their report cards are based on business performance, all right? How well they increase their sales revenues or do their profits go up? Are they enhancing their market share? And I guess secondarily also is their reputation improving? While on the other side of the equation, from the public health perspective, it comes from the dimension of preventing disease, promoting health. And we're looking really at health outcomes. And those two aren't always in alignment. They can be, and I believe that's what we'll talk about today, those areas where we have win-wins. But structurally, you can see that we're coming at this from two separate directions. And when you look at the current approach now, we had a session. Our second one was on sugar-sweetened beverages. And the notions that are often out there, like restricting the sales or um, halting or constraining marketing programs to kids, taxing sodas, limiting portion sizes, et cetera, not so much judging on the merits of this, but what tends to happen is that these are restrictive type measures and what they do is they fight the growth mandate that the companies have. So again, structurally, you have approaches to problems that, again, are almost guaranteed to create some kind of disagreement and, and at the worst case, some conflict. So again, what we want to do is, is understand these perspectives so that as we move forward, we could craft some solutions that work for both sides. There is a win-win here. We just have to be smart in how we look at things and evaluate them. So today, what we'll be doing is addressing a number of questions. First of all, when we talk about successful commitments, what made them work? 
and perhaps what could we even do better with some of the commitments out there? And are there best practice lessons that could be applied to this kind of situation? And then when we look at are there opportunities for both industry and public health in focusing on commitments and collaborating together, is there a win-win here? Again, I'm, I'm jaded. I believe there is. But nevertheless, we need proof points here, and we'll discuss some of those. We also will go over the challenges industry faces when they develop these kind of commitments. And we also will look at the potential impact on outcomes. In other words, one of the big questions we ultimately need to ask is not so much are we, let's say, reducing consumption of certain products, but more importantly, as we look at the mega goal, are we making impact in terms of the public health mission that we're trying to accomplish. And I think that really is really important to think about that as an overriding factor. And then finally, how can the public health community encourage and support industry commitments uh, as a way to shift uh, obesity-related outcomes, again, to help accomplish the mission that public health is entrusted with? So with that as background, Again, we'll focus on our joint opportunities between business and public health, and we'll talk about how to frame commitments so that they could be uh, more effective and that they actually help us achieve our objectives. So what I want to do is start with uh, what I like to call the gold standard, and that is the uh, Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation commitment to pull out a trillion and a half calories from the U.S. marketplace. And um, as reported, even through 2012, uh, the companies, the 16 companies that were part of that commitment actually uh, achieved a $6.4 trillion reduction in calories, which was four times higher than the commitment. And what made this successful, again, we'll go through some details, but this was a partnership. It was an industry initiative with uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's involvement, um, Barry Popkin at UNC Chapel Hill did analyses. So everybody was in this thing together. And I think that's a very, very critical aspect of why this was effective. And at the end of this, uh, there was a lot of good publicity. This is uh, national uh, public television, uh, Judy Woodruff. Um, Risa Lavisa More of uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Andrew Nui, CEO of PepsiCo. Again, this, this is everybody in it together, diving in both feet to make improvements in Americans' health. And I think that was uh, uh, the big outcome of this, which was very positive. So when you look at what were the elements that made this successful, it's very important to think about things. First of all, it was firm, it was verifiable, and it identified an amount that was to be lowered, in this case calories, and the time frame. It was over five years initially that were looked at. Uh, if you don't nail this down, it becomes uh, a, quote, loosey-goosey kind of commitment, and it leaves a lot of room for wandering around and never really accomplishing what is set out. So again, it needs to be quantifiable and verifiable. Secondly, it still has to have some potential for industry to succeed. If it's so, it needs to be a stretch. I believe there's an opportunity to stretch what industry needs to do at the same time. Uh, it can't be so far that you're, you're guaranteed to fail. So it's striking that balance between we need to make some serious headway here but we don't want to be setting people up to failure. And in the case of calories, calories is also another area that industry can control. And calories comes in many forms. It can be sugar, but it could also be fats. And, and in tertiary manner, even protein. But that's really what companies can control. When we start getting into the other ingredients, uh, oftentimes some companies have a much more difficult time controlling the specific individual ingredients, so something to consider. It's a win-win, all right? Both win. It's not an either-or. It's not industry digging in saying, I'm not going to change, and it's not public health saying, I wish to impose something on you. This is an element that is very critical, and again, we've found the time where 
the consumer trends are such that they're demanding healthier products, lower calorie products, more portion control products. These are the growth opportunities now for companies. So uh, they could uh, do very well by also making their products uh, better. Uh, the players involved were not only important, but highly credible, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, it was highly focused. It was calories only. Uh, a, an important aspect to remember, particularly from the, the public health community, because you're, you're so attuned to all the things that couldn't be corrected, we have to be careful about dropping everything in this bushel basket and asking companies to change everything at the same time uh, in the same priority order. Uh, so it's just something to think about because companies are real good if they can drill down on a target, um, a singular target, and uh, let them focus on it, get it done, and then you can move to the next target. Those turn out to be much more effective ways to motivate and uh, ignite industry uh, engagement. And shared ownership and communication results, as I just showed you with the uh, National Public Television uh, program. And again, uh, Jim Marks of Robert Wood Johnson made a made a wonderful comment, and that is, this is win-win. Industry can be part of the solution, but it has to be aligned also with the public health goals. And again, that's what happened in this particular circumstance. Uh, another example uh, is uh, the Partnership for a Healthy America. Next Friday is the annual uh, PHA Summit. And um, for those of you who are going, I do host a panel next Friday the 20th where we call it the Executive uh, Tell-All. Uh, this year we'll be having some uh, executives from the confections industry talk about what they're doing and what their challenges are, what they hope to do, perhaps where they might be falling short. So if you're there, we hope you attend. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about what they've been doing. And the, the Partnership for Healthy America has set up some very specific guiding principles. They want to uh, include meaningful commitments from partners, and they sign a memorandum of understanding, and everything they do is tracked. And uh, there is public reporting of this. And of course, they get a prestigious platform uh, coming out of the First Ladies Summit to announce their commitments. And uh, Michael will share uh, some of what Dannon is doing, for instance, because Dannon is one of the companies that has made a uh, commitment with Partnership for a Healthier America. And when you look at an example of one of the commitments, uh, Birdseye, for instance, made the commitment to conduct marketing and advertising to encourage children to consume more vegetables, uh, including spending at least $2 million uh, directly at children. They made the commitment uh, four years ago, and uh, so far, they we validated that they've spent $3.7 million to marketing and effort, uh, efforts to encourage kids to enjoy and consume beverages using their Step Up to the Plate campaign. And again, this, this one's kind of a win-win. I mean, birds I sell vegetables, so they're obviously very happy if they're selling more vegetables. At the same time, by finding ways uh, to get children to consume more, uh, that's good for our kids' health. So again, a classic win-win. Uh, something on a parallel basis is the F and V or fruit and vegetable campaign that's also supported by the Partnership for a Healthier America. Again, trying to get kids to eat more fruits and vegetables using celebrities, et cetera, with some pretty heavy duty marketing behind it. And you can see that um, something like that could be very effective. All right, I seem to have lost my control of the slides. All right, there we go. Uh, so the question is, why is this approach effective? Let's go through the reasons again. Uh, just like with Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation, firm quantifiable commitments by company. All right, secondly, they are achievable, but there needs to be some effort. In other words, companies either have to spend some marketing dollars or they have to make some changes to their products or in the case of some of the retailers, uh, make more better for you, products more visible in the stores. There has to be something tangible. 
Uh, and the one thing that this platform does is it does allow for a broader array of companies. It's not simply limited to food industry, but also a lot of the retailers, you know, the Walgreens of the world, if you would, uh, but also uh, food companies uh, along with them. And then, it's, again, it's a classic quid pro quo, all right? It's prestigious, visible platform for industry. They get some positive PR. Uh, and, oh, by the way, they get to grow their business because what they're doing actually is right in the sweet spot for where consumers are going. And at the same time, from a public health perspective, perspective uh, you're moving companies in a direction that helps you achieve your missions behind your products, uh, what you want them to do with their products. And again, uh, as written in Forbes, uh, this has proven to be a, a model that works very effectively and a means to help create win-win types of propositions. You know, other things that are cropping up, uh, there's a new soft drink calorie reduction initiative to take yet another 20% of the beverage calories out. And the way they're going about it is to increase access. So this is a distribution play to promote more of the, the smaller sizes, promote water, the no or lower calorie kinds of options uh, out there. Uh, they will also provide calorie counts and calorie awareness campaign and to launch a national consumer awareness and engagement program. And just for perspective, uh, if you look at uh, should they achieve this level of reducing calories another 20%, you're going to be down to levels not seen since the late 1970s in per capita consumption of soft drinks, uh, which was before the time I actually uh, was in that industry for a little bit. So, you know, my look at this is that, again, if the goal is to reduce the consumption of those products, these kind of win-win scenarios are moving in that direction that will help both sides achieve what they need to do. Because another thing to recognize is companies are also figuring out that they could also uh, be profitable by selling uh, these kinds of items. Now, I want to use one uh, example uh, and pose a question, and that is the National Restaurant Association has a Kids Live Well program uh, to help uh, restaurateurs serve more healthy products and, and to give them kudos for coming up with this effort. Uh, basically the criteria is to offer basically two items. One is a, a full meal that's less than 600 calories and has certain nutritional aspects to it and also uh, another individual or side item that has uh, less than or equal 200 calories and certain nutritionals. Uh, to make available nutritional profile, the keyword here is upon request. And finally, um, okay, don't want to click again. Number four. Yeah, up. Well, to promote these. So let's go to uh, my key issues on this. First of all, unlike the first two examples we gave, it's not really a firm, verifiable commitment. Yes. There are 42,000 individual restaurant units that are participating in tracks. So this is this is good news. Uh, we like that. And I'm sorry, I'm just my clicker is not working here. There we go. Uh, there is no time frame attached to this, uh, and I think time frames are very important. You have to say we're going to do X in three years, five years, seven years, whatever the magic period. And there's no tangible results that are tracked. So again, I think uh, unlike, let's say, taking calories out or increasing uh, visibility, uh, better for you options in 90% of the restaurants, something like that would be a lot more tangible. Uh, or number of calories sold per restaurant unit would be another example. And of course, there's no third party tracking as is done on both the Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation pledges and the uh, Partnership for a Healthier America pledges. And I'm just waiting for my clicker to continue working. Sorry for this delay. Okay. And my final point before uh, inviting Derek to speak is um, this is a critical time for industry. Uh, doing nothing is not an option. Uh, you know, 
industries always look at the pros and the cons. Well, you know, if you don't do anything, there's no disruption to business and operations, and you know, maybe it'll go away. On the other hand, uh, given the environment today, the list of kinds is uh, a lot longer. Uh, clearly, there's more attacks on industry for um, selling products that are less than healthy or marketing practices or labeling, et cetera, down the list. Uh, these are accelerating, which yields negative publicity. And perhaps from a business standpoint, uh, one of my messages to companies is that, you know what, pay attention because uh, whether you like or dislike uh, what people are saying about your industry or your company, if you don't pay attention, you're missing out on shifting consumer trends and new business opportunities, which is what we try to do at Hudson Institute, which is show companies that pay attention. This is where your growth is going to come from over the next decade. So you need to jump on this and not resist it. And if they don't do anything, others will decide your fate, particularly at retail, all right, because the retailer is at the front line of the consumer, and they're hearing from consumers what they want or don't want. And finally, when it's all done, if they don't do anything, there will be downward sales pressures. So I always like to use this little visual about our um, board of directors here. Uh, motion is made and seconded that we would stick our head in the sand. This is not an option for us right now and that it's much wiser to pay attention and uh, jump on this as an opportunity, not only to do good, but also to do good for your business. So at this point, if my clicker cooperates with me, there we go, uh, I'd like to introduce Derek Yak, who will be our next speaker. And just by way of background, Derek is the Chief Health Officer of Vitality. Uh, Derek has um, a wonderful career where he's focused on advancing global health. Um, prior to Vitality, he served as the Senior Vice President of Global Health and Agriculture Policy at PepsiCo, where he supported their portfolio transformation. He has also headed global health at the Rockefeller Foundation. He's been a professor of global health at Yale University and is a former executive director for non-communicable diseases and mental health at the World Health Organization. So uh, thank you, Derek. We welcome you and look forward to hear what you have to say. Great. Thanks, Hank. And uh, let me go to the next slide. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And um, I hope to compliment uh, a number of the comments made by Hank. Um, and focus quite tightly on the question of obesity. Um, what are companies doing or who have done? Um, what is it um, that needs to be done by complementary industries? And what is it that government could do that could accelerate and enhance the probability of, co of uh, companies being more successful? And I mentioned that last point because we often uh, put the onus on companies to make the progress without considering what is hampering them making progress from a regulatory perspective, and what are some of the signals that could move us ahead. Um, so on this slide, I highlight, as many of you know, um, the complex links that drive obesity. Um, and this is from the 2007 um, obesity report from the UK, where their conclusion was that all players needed to come on board to have an impact. And impact should be measured right in the middle in terms of um, the energy balance equation. Basically, are we going to be able to reduce net calories through a range of measures, both on the food side and on the activity side? Next. Um, I put this up to remind us that while we're thinking about the role of industry, we also have to be realistic about what are the forces against partnerships. And while I believe and have seen through my work both at WHO and at PepsiCo the enormous value of working together, the climate has to be right for that to actually happen. And um, these are some of the actual quotes by the current Director General of the World Health Organization, um, which really frame the issue of working with multinationals in extremely negative terms. In fact, some have said that the language is about the most negative, not just to the food industry, but to the wide range of other sectors that have some impact on health for good or maybe for not so good, 
including the pharmaceutical industry, medical devices, the insurance sector, uh, the alcohol sector, uh, and a wide range of others, the motor vehicle sector. Um, it's critical that the climate be right to actually have partnerships built. And I think at the moment, at the global level, uh, when it comes to WHO, there's still a lot of work to be done. Whereas in contrast, the United Nations more broadly, through the Sustainable Development Goals, give really strong emphasis to the role of the private sector, helping to address the SDGs as they um, are tackled over the next few decades. Slide. So let me go through a couple of the points. Some of them I won't go dwell on, uh, since Hank has mentioned. What have food companies done to cut calories supplied to the US population? Next. Um, Hank mentioned the healthy weight commitment. And I think we will continue to talk about it because it's an example of not requiring trust, but verification. Uh, the data that is based upon the assessment was done by some of the most critical epidemiologists and economists um, who look very warily at whether industry pledges work. They set up an extraordinary infrastructure with the support of RWJ to actually assess the true impact. And the results, as Hank said, showed that industry exceeded the goals. I would say there are two caveats that we need to always remember that embedded in the report, there were some areas where additional work is required, particularly focusing on how to reduce uh, calorie consumption among minority groups across the country, which requires, I think, a fairly amount of substantive amount of work going forward. And secondly, the importance of sustaining the effort and the initiative over time and expanding it in many ways uh, to include a broader range of uh, food companies, many of whom are out of the spectrum um, for critique because they happen to be local, small, um, independent groups, yet they are significant contributors to the net calories of the U.S. population. Next one. Well, how did they do this? It wasn't um, magic. It was very carefully planned, thought through strategies. And some of them we know well. The one was reformulation to reduce sugar content, a wide range of means of doing it, either dialing up zero calorie options on the water and water related products, or dialing up the use of a range of nutritive sweeteners, either cal caloric or non-caloric. And here we have an example of uh, what's out there. And um, I think you can see that um, competition here works to provide a wider range of choice for, for consumers. Being inside um, Pepsi at the time, I was very aware that whatever we were going to do to try and lower calories, our colleagues at Coke were going to do, and all for the better, because the consumer was going to be given a wider range of options to select from. The same is true in many of the other categories of foods and beverages that have um, sugar levels that need to be reduced. Next one. Um, obviously, reformulation is important, but I've always felt that putting our finger far more firmly on portion size and reversing the trends in supersizing and very large um, plates of food that have become the culture and expectation in the US uh, would really have a long-term sustained impact. And here we see the explosion of reduced portion sizes that are happening both in the beverage, snacks, and even in the food sector. The good news about this is that if it's done right, it's actually a win from a profitability point of view because the net price and the net profitability on the smaller portions are higher than on the larger ones. And for the consumer, this also allows them to be signaled to eat in smaller amounts. So even though they will be, uh, the profitability of a company can go up, net calories can continue to be reduced. The only downside one needs to look at, um, I think, is uh, related to the packaging issues and the environmental impact. And with regard to that, we'll see all of these companies have dialed up their efforts to try and become more biodegradable and recyclable. Next one. Um, we've seen, and again, uh, Hank mentioned some of these, a wide range of initiatives, some led through the, the White House initiative that Michelle Obama, uh, Sam Cass, and the teams did so effectively, um, particularly reducing access um, to high-calorie snacks and beverages uh, at places where they're likely to reach kids. Um, and um, before the, um, the, the Move for Health initiative started, uh, we had, I think, the real success of President Clinton at the time 
bringing together Coke, Pepsi, and a wide range of beverage companies to make a voluntary commitment to take um, uh, full calorie beverages out of the school system. The result of that alone uh, had a, a measurable impact in reducing the calories consumed in the school system and started a long-term discussion around what are the desirable beverages that we want our young kids to have access to on a regular and easy basis. And of course, I mean, a lot of it starts with water and uh, low calorie options. Next one. Much of the debate over the decades has always really been on marketing and um, marketing on un unhealthy products. I think we've seen since the 80s that the era of marketing, not just in the food sector, but in fact across all consumer goods, has really exploded along with the changes in media, the expansion of television and our social media and a wide range of other electronic outlets have really meant that marketers um, often fulfill their mandate by saying let's flood the media with the stuff we try to sell without being given any constraints on um, thinking about the consequences for health or in fact in some cases the environment. That is shifting and I think we're in an era where we're seeing um, uh, serious restraints being played by companies voluntarily, supported in some parts of the around, around the world by regulatory standards, and most importantly being demanded by the consumers, particularly uh, young families and mothers, um, expecting that the norm should be to reduce the potential for pest to power. Um, and here we have an example of uh, just how tough it is to go around a supermarket with a kid when they're looking at these exciting fun uh, boxes which are marketed very attractively to kids. This is going to take a long-term shift um, in how our business operates, and I suspect it's going to be more complex over time given the range of new media. Next. Um, we've also seen dialing up the healthier part of the diet, um, and some of this is, has actually been hampered, and I'll mention later, by the fact that the pricing of healthier foods, whether they're vegetables, nuts, grains, whatever, tend to be more expensive than using everything derived from corn and soy, uh, where the government subsidy structures are very favorable, and uh, as opposed to um, new commodities where we're trying to dial up fruits and vegetables, where government support and voice is actually being very weak. Next one. One of the true proofs of whether a company is serious about change, I believe, requires us to look at their R&D portfolio and budget. And in the last couple of years, um, for some companies stepping back decades, there has been a quiet and steady increase in the quality of science around nutrition and an increased um, public uh, uh, sharing of what they're doing. So you'll see the Nestle Research Center on the left, underneath it the Unilever Research Center. And I, I, mentioned, I indicate from the recent um, PepsiCo report that they're being very explicit about the dollar amount invested in R&D. Here we see it's around three quarters of a billion dollar in the last year. A significant amount of that would be for some of the transformational work going on, and these figures would probably be greater in some of the European-based companies. But this is an important signal that the companies are looking at the future portfolio not through the eyes of simply changing the packaging or changing the marketing, but through fundamental research. And the research is going into deep areas of biology, um, of systems research, that I think are going to be quite transformative. And hopefully, over the next few years, we will see that we will have better developed nutrition-based solutions based on solid science that may, in actually, in time, start displacing the need for a wide range of pharmaceuticals that are allegedly out there to address the nutritional fail our, our failures in our nutrition system. And certainly that's where the companies that are on this list and others like Danone are betting big time. And I think the consumer will benefit enormously. So if you really doubt whether a company is serious, look at the R&D budget, look at the level of R&D investment and their relationships with academic institutions. If they're strong, vibrant, and growing, they are serious. Next one. I think the interesting thing is to see how we've seen adjacent company actions move into the obesity agenda. And I won't go through them, but um, we have on the, your top left our partnership with John Hancock, where now we've launched a large discount on healthy foods through a life insurance company. Um, who would have thought that would happen? And the reason is very simple. 
if you eat healthier, you're going to extend your life. If you extend your life, you'll pay your premiums for longer. So the company benefits and the consumer benefits. I suspect we'll see a lot more of these kind of interesting initiatives. On the right, you see some of the advanced approaches we're seeing in Europe where Tesco removed sweets and candies from the checkout counter. And of course, that immediately changed the pester power in the store. I suspect that we'll see a lot of retailers doing it across the US, not necessarily for health reasons, but because we're starting to have automated checkout counters and you can't clutter up the space. I don't mind what reason they use to do it. If they do it, it's going to have a positive effect on consumption. And on the bottom, you can see the error of wearables, of personalized knowing your numbers is also driving people to a greater awareness of the quantity and quality of food they're doing relative to the amount of activity they're putting out. That, again, is an unstoppable trend that I think is going to help us see new partners for addressing obesity. Next. Um, and this is just the example of a couple of weeks ago where Grand Central was completely transformed um, to become a marketplace for healthy foods through John Hancock's work. And again, just think about it. A life insurance company partnering with a health company to actually drive healthy foods is not something we thought would happen a few years ago. Next. Well, external reinforcement helps. Next one. I think the work that um, uh, has been coming out of the Hudson Institute has shown us very clearly that this is good for the bottom line. The healthier parts of the portfolio yield higher profits than the rest, which means that the investors will stay on board. And in the next slide, we've seen that um, many of the large investor groups, um, I think the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch work, identifying the companies that are providing solutions to obesity, uh, the obesity epidemic, provide a positive carrot rather than a stick to encourage companies to go faster. And in the catalog, they list the companies. They happen to be food, retail, weight management, some pharmaceutical, some activity, to show that it's taking an ecology of companies to tackle obesity. But many are there, even though they may start from a position where they may still have a high proportion of obesogenic products, the movement is happening in a positive direction and being rewarded and measured through the Access to Nutrition Index. Next. One important critical thing that's changing is that we've always known that taste, convenience, and price have been seen as the three most powerful determinants of food consumption as well as of food service use. And McDonald's have known it for years and have benefited enormously from it. I think we've seen the shift through Chipotle happen because as these, these reports show, those factors are no longer as important for millennials as two additional factors, the healthiness of the product and its sustainability. As those start increasing, we are likely to see a greater push from the consumer to actually absorb the increased healthiness of products out there. Next. So let me end with a few brief words about what could government do to make these journeys happen quicker? Next slide. I won't go into greater depth, but it is a bit of a national scandal that doesn't get spoken about how little the National Institutes of Health with a $30 billion budget spends on true nutrition science with an immediate preventive capability. The failure to do that means that each company has to reinvent their own basic science to find the right sweeteners to replace sugar with, to find the best way of lowering sodium, to find the best way to address some of the complex portion size issues and behavioral science required. That is very different than the pharmaceutical industry, where there's a big support structure on basic science that allows companies to develop, for example, statins. This is an issue where government, if they stepped up significantly, could have a big positive effect, and um, this provides some of the empirical evidence for it. Next. In stepping up, I believe very strongly that the solution must lie, as it does in every other development sector of society, in more rigorous relationships between academia and food companies. In doing that, many of the concerns have been raised recently around conflicts of interest and some of the negative um, aspects have been in the media. In this BMJ debate, we make the case for why critically uh, the food industry needs to think of stepping up its relationship with academia, but put in place the protections 
on the academic side and on the industry side to ensure that conflict of interest is reduced to a minimum as it's effectively done in the areas of environment and oil and management of seed and agriculture where the complexity and the issues of controversy may even be greater. Next. Clearly, if a company, and we saw the bird's eye example, is trying to increase vegetable sales and government were to be far more vigorous in proposing the same kind of standards through massive campaigns, we would have a great synergy of effect. Unfortunately, the budgets for the CDC and many of the other public budgets on healthy foods have been cut in recent years, um, not allowing this to happen. Bringing it back would actually allow the markets to work even more effectively uh, and have some synergy with government. Next one, and I think the last slide. The issues of financing agriculture, of course, need to be looked at. And I put this up for two reasons. One, because I think you may find it useful to read through what are the roles that agriculture play in actually looking at and food prices and what we consume. But secondly, because this was a contribution that PepsiCo did to invest in this report during the United Nations high-level meeting in 2011. We hoped that WHO would join forces with the Food and Agriculture Organization, as we hope health ministries at the government level would do with the agriculture ministries, to actually have a synergistic single goal, improving the quality of nutrition of the population, and putting that as the central goal both of agriculture and their health and nutrition policy. Unfortunately, very few companies have yet moved in that direction. Next slide. None of this happens without leadership. And I just put up some of the people I've seen over the last few years and who are going to become our inspiring leaders who speak out very clearly about the power of partnerships and actually take action from their own area. Of course, we have Michelle Obama, my previous boss, Andrew Nui, Sam Cass, who you may know is the great chef from the White House, continuing to do amazing work, uh, Risa Luisa More from Robert Wood Johnson, bringing together the private and public partnership in ways that were never possible before, and somebody who you may not know, but it's important to watch, Lisa Kingho, the new director of the United Nations Global Compact, where in her role, she really serves as the private-public arm of the United Nations, clearly committed to harnessing the power of the private sector to meet the big SDG challenges of our time. Thank you very much. Derek, thank you so much. Uh, some tremendous insight that uh, we have not seen before. I was particularly interested in, and could not agree with you more relative to the need for more industry, academia, and scientific uh, collaborations that work across the board because I think it's essential to have research that's credible uh, and believable and at the same time works for both sides. So thank you so much for those insights. Uh, I'd like to now introduce, next slide, uh, Michael Newworth, who is the Senior Director of Public Relations at the Bannon Company. Uh, Michael is a uh, communications professional with over 20 years of experience in both corporate and agency settings. Uh, prior to Bannon, he has served in executive roles with uh, Ruder Finn and also Porter Novelli Public Relations Agencies and has uh, sat on the Communications Committee of the International Bottled Water Association. And he's here to tell you about Dannon's story. So, Michael, welcome and thank you. Did we lose Michael? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we have you, Michael. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. So thank you to Hank and to uh, Becky and the Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation for the invitation to share a, a very brief case study uh, about Denone. Next slide. So if you're not aware, Denone is, uh, at least in the United States, perhaps one of the largest food and beverage companies you've never heard of. Uh, our mission is very simple, with health up front. Uh, bringing health through food to the largest number of people. Next slide. However, um, and, and to that end, we are focused in four very specific uh, quadrants. Uh, dairy, yogurt being our largest sector. Uh, globally, you'll know us in the United States through Danon and uh, Light and Fit. I think on one of the slides previously, you saw one of our products. 
um, uh, early life nutrition, which is foods for those who are uh, in need and generally prescribed by a physician, uh, medical nutrition, uh, sorry as well, and then lastly waters, um, all only in, um, in bottled uh, spring waters primarily throughout the world. Next slide. Our company, though, did not uh, was not born this way. In fact, uh, about 20 years ago, a very concerted decision was made to focus exclusively on the health aspect uh, of food. And um, you can see on the left, we were extremely diversified uh, with uh, big business in cookies, uh, cheese, um, beers, and, and other products. And over the years, have have migrated to today where we are, as I said, 100% focused on health. Next slide. So specific to the commitment I'll focus in the United States we've made to improving our products, next slide, um, we chose very carefully um, the Partnership for a Healthier America when we were assessing opportunities um, to make a very public commitment uh, that would involve both the transformation of our portfolio of yogurt products, this is specific to our dairy business in the United States, uh, that I think as Hank said, are very specific because we need targets in the private sector to, to really move the business forward uh, that were transparent in how we're reporting through independent evaluation done by PHA. And um, our commitment broke down into four areas. There were some do's and do nots. And on the do's, it was improve on nutrient density. So starting in the dairy sector uh, with yogurt, which begins as an inherently uh, better for you product, um, we sought to increase nutrients uh, via formula, things like vitamin D, calcium, potassium, while at the same time decreasing the percent of sugar and fat. Um, last year, this is results from 2015. Next year, uh, for this year's results, we will announce at Partnership for a Healthier America Summit next Thursday. Um, for those in attendance, please look for that. Um, and the progress we've made um, has been very limited on the nutrient density, in large part because of the shift in products in the yogurt sector. Um, the migration to uh, Greek yogurt during this period, uh, we did not initially have vitamin D added to one of our key brands of, of Greek yogurt, and that uh, slowed us down on progress, but we will be announcing greater progress on that metric uh, next week. Um, some of the more specific components of nutrient density, we said uh, in terms of fat reduction, we would migrate uh, to a portfolio of 75% of, of low-fat and non-fat products. Um, we will next week announce some good progress on that. Sugar reduction, uh, perhaps the one that is focused on most closely by uh, those in the analyst community, both food analysts, financial analysts, and, and health analysts, um, where we have made excellent progress and we will report continued progress there. And then a research and education investment, which for us is uh, really about promoting, similar to the bird's eye commitment you saw, promoting uh, better for you products, including yogurt, and uh, we are continuing to make excellent progress on that metric. This is a three-year commitment, uh, and next year, next week rather, we'll report progress on year two. Next slide. I'll mention on the Partnership for Healthy America, this is based on actual volume sold. So it's not based on changes that we make to our products, but the volume sold. So when it comes to rubber meeting the road and consumer preference uh, and matching, uh, fulfilling that, that's a critical component for us. Okay, so very specifically to an, a point that um, Derek, I think, mentioned on the importance of R&D, uh, our best-selling kids product is a smoothie called Danimals. Uh, build on this slide. You can build two, please, Ali. Um, and uh, it took us about two and a half years in our pursuit of sugar reduction on this product to identify a way to reduce by 25% the total sugar. 
and it involved a complicated process because yogurt is naturally tart. It involved a process of identifying cultures, yogurt cultures, that would produce a less tart white mass, leading to the option of reduced added sugar and flavor optimization. You can build, uh, Ali. That got us to a significant 25% reduction in sugar uh, from 14 grams to 10 grams while retaining all of the important nutrients that moms are looking for for kids. Um, and then the next two builds, Allie. Um, so tremendous uplift in nutrient density, significant reduction in total sugar. Um, and most importantly, we did this in a move of stealth health. Uh, we enacted the change, obviously updating the nutrition facts panel as we implemented the product, but we didn't advertise it. In fact, we waited until uh, the product had become uh, a success in the marketplace. While it continued to grow market share, only after the fact did we announce what we had done. Uh, this was uh, about two years ago and has continued to grow uh, in, in our portfolio, this Danimal smoothie product. Next slide. And I think that takes us done. All right, Michael, thank you so much. And, and Michael just made a great point about stealth health. Uh, with the exception of uh, those of us who really try to uh, eat more healthy, follow a healthier lifestyle, uh, let's go meet our neighbors. And the rest of them are driven mostly by taste. So the use of uh, what Michael described as stealth health is very critical for many of these companies because in signaling that a product is healthier to most consumers, it signals that it doesn't taste as good. So this is a very important consideration as companies try to affect their portfolios and make changes. What we'll do now is, and I'm going to go through this quickly to allow for some questions, and again, we're, we're happy to stay over a couple of extra minutes, but I want to go through you know, what makes a commitment work? What are the kinds of things that we have to think about? And when you look across the elements, again, we talked earlier about there needs to be a real specific, quantifiable, measurable goal. And the goal has to be a stretch, but it also has to be attainable. And uh, something that many don't consider, the objective has to be compatible across all involved companies. If you're in, involved in an industry, uh, for instance, reducing calories all companies can do, but if you have a group of companies where one has products that are mostly, let's say, sugar-oriented versus fat-oriented or sodium-oriented, they're all going in different directions. So the key is to make sure that whatever goal is determined, it is compatible across the line. And finally, it has to be win-win. We're to the point now where it's not I win, you lose, but rather how do I grow from a corporate standpoint and at the same time help public health community accomplish its important goals. So the process of going through this is, uh, and I'm involved with several companies and industry sectors looking at co uh, commitment options, and you come up with alternatives, you screen them, and most importantly, what they call is a dimensionalization step. In other words, what happens if we do X? All right, what happens not only to the business metrics, sales, whatever, but also can an improvement be made on an important health metric? And those things need to be done in advance. And then at that point, you prioritize and then select. And just to give you some examples as to screen commitments, uh, there's a number of factors across the top of this chart. If you're doing an industry commitment, it has to have broad inclusion. If it excludes your biggest players, you're not going to be effective. Secondly, does it address the primary public health goals? Third thing, is it credible? And fourth, what are the key metrics that you will measure? And I'll, I'm just going to flash some examples uh, of things. For packaged goods companies, we've identified three priority buckets where commitments can be made. Transparency is one. Marketing and advertising is two. And of course, product choice or portfolio diversification or re, um, reformulation would be three. This would be a little different for retailers, for instance. You might make um, visibility or accessibility of healthier products more prominent in that kind of environment. And then for each one of these, you'd go through, in this case, transparency, 
look at certain examples of types of commitments that could be made, whether it's uh, adopting smart labels or front of pack labeling or not making certain claims on the label, and you then run through this process to show whether it meets or does not meet the criteria across the top and, of course, what kind of metrics you might apply here. Uh, and again, you do the same thing for marketing and advertising examples. For instance, uh, would you consider stretching the no marketing to children or teens under 14 instead of 12? Or would you pledge to put more hard dollars, hard marketing and educational dollars into lower income underserved communities? Or would you uh, market on PAC to educate? And again, look across these to make sure that these criteria are met and again do the same thing for product diversification. Uh, the calorie commitment that we shared earlier not only healthy weight but also from the uh, soft drink industry uh, would be one example or a sugar reduction commitment or increase the number of portion control packages etc. These are all things that would fit here. But the most important message again, is you need to meet those criteria up at the top of the page. And portfolio diversification is something that even McKinsey uh, has pointed out in their report, where if you look at those actions that could yield right to the right of those, that circle, the biggest impact improving um, uh, lifespan. All right, it's clear that portion control reformulation and uh, the accessibility or availability of better for you kinds of options would have the biggest impact. So again, these are areas that companies can control at the same time they would yield the biggest benefit to public health. And I think this is a very important factor to remember by the public health community to understand there is a prioritization of what can be done that yields the best impact to achieving the mission and the focus ought to be here as opposed to those that are secondary or even tertiary. And then just in summary, these commitments ultimately need to be tracked by a third party as is done in both Healthy Weight and also for um, the Partnership for Healthy America. Nail the time frames. Make sure we have public health and academic input on the metrics. We don't want to do metrics that are not applicable. Transparency is absolutely critical. Uh, going back to some of Derek's points about uh, combining collaborations with industry and the scientific community, I think it's not only important intra-industry and NGO, but also among consumers. Consumers want everything more transparent. And then quantify the direct impact. Let's see if it really does help solve a problem and ultimately report on the progress and the opportunities that are presented. And then when the day is done, closing thought, if we can focus on the solutions and the impact we have, that ought to be the driving factor in establishing commitments, and that's the basis for putting together best practices and forging ways for both industry and the public health community to make solid, constructive steps forward in this arena. I think we've made some good progress. We still have more to go, but I think this provides uh, a good model to follow for us to make more progress. At this point, I thank everybody. We've gone right up to 12, but I'm certainly uh, happy to stay on for a couple of more minutes. If there are any questions um, that have come through, we're more than happy to answer those. Hank, we have two questions. The first is from Emma Gregory, and I think it speaks somewhat to Derek's comment about research dollars, but I think you should probably take a crack at it first. Um, it's how can we measure and demonstrate that food and beverage companies' removal of calories are making a dent on the end goal of reducing calorie intake or lowering, lowering obesity rates? Well, that is, <laughs> that is the question. And I think uh, there's a number of pieces of research. It's very piecemeal. Uh, there have been certain uh, analyses that have done that, that have looked at what they call substitution effect, where if you uh, consume one item and then start shifting it over to something else, are you net-net reducing your caloric input? And I think that kind of research needs to be combined with these kind of initiatives. The second 
part of the answer I want to give is each company can do what they can do. So in the case of calories, again, I think those companies, uh, for instance, you know, you look at the beverage industry, clearly there's an opportunity to take down calories and sugar. Uh, if you look at some of the meals companies, they could reduce calories via the saturated fats. The next step would be, as Derek suggested, this collaboration with the industry work that's being done combined with additional scientific and academic work on top of that so we can see now at the lower consumption if that is now translating into uh, lower obesity rates as the, the holy grail, if you would. I think that is the next pathway. Derek, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything to that. We might have lost Derek. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, yeah, no, I do want to add something very brief, um, Hank. I think um, one of the critical issues that we really need is, um, and I think the speaker talks to it, is we do need better refined data on an ongoing basis. I think people may not be aware that the creation of the Healthy Weight uh, Commitment Foundation has actually started building a, uh, a database of where the calories are. Um, but I think we need to go further and basically I think an integration between NHANES, the government-funded National Health and uh, Nutrition Evaluation Studies, and um, the, uh, the companies who actually produce the food really could actually lead to us having a much refined answer of knowing what are the major contributors to excess calories in the diet, are they coming down over time, and why are they coming down? Is it a result of particular sectors or activities? If we started thinking about those being critical questions, we've got the means to put them in place. And as far as I know, the only country where we have verifiable data on where the excess calories are coming from in kids uh, is the UK. And that is a very strong basis, at least in the United Kingdom, for them to say where do we need to place our policy focus, and it tends to give us answers that are surprising. They're not going to be the obvious, um, simply put it all onto one nutrient carrot category, for example. That's helpful. The other question we have is, sodium reduction in the U.S. has not made the impressive progress compared to the U.K. and other countries. What specific steps would you recommend for food and beverage companies, food retailers, and the U.S. restaurant sector to help Americans reach the five to six grams of salt per person per day targets recommended by the expert groups. Vipika Crack is the person who asked that question, and Derek, you're probably best suited to answer, in my opinion. Well, yes, and I think um, we did see many uh, efforts to get this moving. I think the New York City health efforts um, under Mayor Bloomberg some time ago brought together food companies, um, and they did actually commit across uh, different parts of the food industry. So uh, bread and uh, baked goods had targets that obviously were different from crisps and uh, potato chips, were different from processed meats and so on. But I think the success requires, again, going the UK route, which was number one, identify where the salt is coming from. Where is the excess salt coming from? And uh, in some parts of the world, it's predominantly coming from bakery and breads, for example. In some places, like China, it's coming from salt added at the table. I would expect in the U.S. it will be closer to the U.K. It will be added into a wide range of uh, dishes, everything from um, pizzas to uh, prepared chicken dishes to uh, breads uh, and to processed meat. And then within each sector, uh, set a, initially a voluntary target and encourage companies to share some of their R&D across the, even their competitive areas so that they can bring the rates down together. Otherwise, you have uncompetitive fields. And the one thing we saw, for example, uh, in the case of PepsiCo, we recognized that the vast majority of salt um, in the South African diet was coming from uh, breads, bakery, and added salt to the table, and that the um, formal snack market constituted maybe 1% of the sodium burden. And yet, in the public's mind, that was the major contributor. It was completely incorrect. So what they did is they set out to voluntarily work with many of the people to have access to knowledge about how do you lower these sodium levels. 
This is a big effort, but I think that the, the yield in terms of lowering it into the right level would be seen in terms of lowered stroke and hypertension rates, which are contributing, obviously, to the national uh, burden. All right. Well, thanks to Derek and Michael for being on this important panel. I'd like to thank our audience for checking in. This is our uh, fifth and final uh, seminar in the seminar series. We hope uh, we've had the opportunity to, to provide some learnings and understanding and all of us remain available to answer any questions that folks in the public health community have as it relates to interactions and collaborations with the industry. So thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you.